Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's My Captain Power Talks on how business etiquette in virtual working environment. My Captain Power Talks is powered by QFIS. QFIS, QFIS provides an interactive cloud-based on-demand mentorship platform and acts as a one-stop hassle-free solution to have conversations with industry leaders. QFIS offers a complete set of tools such as hosting skills, knowledge-based workshops, and coaching, which enhances the skills of individuals. It is more of a safe space outside your office or public space where you get insights from the leaders who have traveled the same path that you are about to take. Today, we have our guest speaker, Nidhi Vinod. One thing that spots our eye is her vivid experience in the field of talent management and organizational development across the country as well as South Asia and the Middle East. With her Excel skills in talent development positions, she has succeeded as a coach in domains of leadership development, career transitions, and career planning. She has been leading as a facilitator in senior leadership programs and certified as Ogun Assessments Coach. Through her perseverance and efforts, she stands as an epitome to all the young minds out there. We are very keen to listen to your talks, experiences, and share your valuable thoughts with us, ma'am. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome you and handing over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much, Devika. I, I do not know whether I am... Uh... Well, I'm worthy of all the epithets and all the lovely compliments that you've given me, but I will definitely try and do justice to our time together. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I, am, I, I get to understand that we are not, uh, we're not going to be opening up the lines for you to talk, so I'm going to miss your voices, but I'm more than happy to hear from you in the chat window. And please feel free to let me know your comments as we go along. Uh, today's session, to my understanding, will be all about questions. So Devika is going to pose a few questions to me. But most importantly, I'm really looking forward to your questions, your questions about business etiquette, about professional etiquette, um, specifically since the, uh, the world of work that we knew has changed so much in the last uh, two years now. And we're hoping that we'll be back to the new normal, but normal nonetheless. Uh, since then, uh, you know, there have been a lot of changes in the world of professional etiquette, and I'm more than happy to bring those changes to you to our conversations. So, Devika, I... If you have questions, shoot questions. I'll be more than happy to take them. Uh, through your excitement, has much more motivated me to deliver the best, ma'am. Yes, Absolutely. we'll start off. Yes. What, what has your journey been like working in talent management, development, and organizational development for more than 17 years, ma'am? Ah, that's, that's, that's always a question that takes me down memory lane. It's almost, first of all, I must tell you that... Uh, I'm a, I'm a vivid believer of the Japanese term Ikigai. If you haven't heard of the term, you must please look it up. I truly believe that uh, when, you, when you find your purpose or your calling, and if those of us who are lucky to find our purpose and our calling in the work that we do, the passage of time is just a byproduct. So honestly, I think I consider myself as one of those lucky few uh, who through early uh, you know, conversations with myself, with my mentors and some guides, was able to identify uh, a lot of purpose in what I do. So talent development, uh, talent management and organizational development is, is something that I continue to be passionate about. And that's why 17 years do not feel like 17 years. But here's what I want to share with you has been uh, my experience. I think the work that I do, it could be defined as three E's. The first one is enriching. Uh, the nature of the work that we do in talent management, talent development is extremely fulfilling. Uh, it's it's absolutely amazing to see that you can bring about changes in the or transformations in the in the destiny of an organization, of a team, and of an individual just by triggering a little bit of behavioral change in an individual. So the work that we do is very satisfying. Uh, it it makes you feel extremely um, accomplished at the end of the day when you've triggered a little bit of a behavior change in, a, in an individual, a little bit of a behavior change in the way they think. And trust me, it's like the domino effect. When an individual starts working and thinking differently, it definitely has, pos has positive uh, impact on the organization. So that's the first one, enriching. The second one is engaging. Uh, for those of you who have had any kind of you know, HR experience, I, I do see a few familiar names and I'm sure they, are, they will share my experience. There's never a dull moment when you're working with people. You know, I'm not saying that... Uh, products or machines can be dull, 
But all I'm saying is that people are amazing to work with. And specifically, when you work in, in the realm of people development, you're dealing with this amazing, what do I say, cornucopia of experiences. Uh, people bring to you their, their experiences. They come to you with a wide variety of challenges. So the work that you do is never done. And I think that is brilliant. And the third E for me is evolving. Now, the field of human resource uh, management, human resource development is a continually development field. You know, we, we always have to stay ahead of the learning curve. I do not remember a year in my life when I have not um, spent time studying or I have not spent time developing my own self first. So a lot of it comes from the inside out. If you're not accomplished, if you're not, uh, you know, learning yourself, you really have no right to go and tell people to develop themselves. So you're constantly learning and therefore even your role and the kind of accountabilities that you, you take on are constantly evolving. So Devika, to answer your question in a very, very long way, those are the three E's, enriching, engaging, and involving. Ma'am, it's very, very thoughtful of you, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you so much. How do you think? Yes, I was really very thoughtful, ma'am. Yeah. How do you think as the perception of business etiquette evolved over the years? Hmm. That's, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. Uh, and I see as some somebody's also quest, had a question in the chat window saying, uh, how has it evolved in the pandemic? Uh, isn't it really funny or isn't it really interesting to note that um, maybe two years ago, maybe sometime in, let's say, 2019, December, if you met with someone and you deliberately put a distance between yourself and them, it would be considered rude. Right? It would actually be considered rude. Imagine if you went and met someone and you gave them a elbow bump. That would be considered extremely rude. But we live in an environment today where that's not only acceptable, that's actually encouraged. And that, my friends, gives you an idea about how business etiquette has evolved over the years. But before we talk a little bit more about it, I just want to explain and speak to you a little bit about what does the term etiquette really mean? You know, you've been hearing the term etiquette, you've been hearing the term social niceties, you've also been hearing the term manners. And sometimes one tends to get confused as to, you know, are they the same thing? So let's just demystify that a little bit. Right, Devika, can we do that? Sure, ma'am, sure. Right? So my dear friends, etiquette is, is in simple terms a customary code of, let's say, polite behavior in society or amongst the members of a particular group, right? It's basically about unwritten rules uh, that govern our social interactions and our behavior, Right? At the heart of good etiquette are three things, respect, kindness, and consideration. So no matter what country you are in, uh, no matter what society you are in, at the heart of any etiquette, any social norms that we follow, any uh, social conventions that we follow, there are three things. There's respect, there is kindness, and there is consideration. Now, while etiquette is a code of conduct, Manners are behaviors that reflect our attitude. So an individual's manners or mannerisms, as we call it, are behaviors that we, that we bring into play or we demonstrate, which reflect our own attitude. So the basic difference between etiquette and manners is that the former, which is etiquette, changes with societal customs, whereas manners remain unchanged across communities. For example, in our country, in our belief, uh, in our country, we, you know, we, we have a social etiquette says that when we meet somebody elderly, we touch their feet. That is governed by the manner that when we see our attitude of saying that when we see somebody elderly, we need to demonstrate respect, right? So that's the manner. But now over a period of time, do you think that the societal etiquette of touching feet has changed? It has. Not, not all of us do that. But have we stopped respect towards elders? No. no. Right? So manners remain unchanged, whereas etiquette tends to change with society. So how has it changed? Over the years, we have found that the way uh, we used to behave earlier used to be very formal. It's currently become informal and certainly casual in certain cultures. But you must remember that Etiquette specifically is deeply rooted in the cultural norms of a particular region or a country. 
So when we are working, I think what we really need to understand is that over the years, in certain countries, the etiquette or social norms may have become fairly casual, but in certain countries, they will still, for example, Japan, they still remain fairly formal. So that's something that I would really want you to keep in mind when you're talking about the evolution of business etiquette. I hope that answers yes, your question, um, Devika. Connect yes, ma'am. Connecting it to a realistic way was yeah. much more understandable for all of us. Yeah. It's come moving on, ma'am. How has technology influenced or changed business etiquettes? Ah, wonderful. I, I love this particular one. In fact, <laughs> I was having the conversation uh, at home very recently with a so my uh, my son is is 19 and I was, you know, he's he's trying to figure out the ways of working virtually now. Uh, and we were having a conversation where he was talking to me about, he says, all this, uh, you know, all this norms that you tell me about business etiquette and about technology having influenced it and, you know, uh, all your confusions around it, aren't they all with to do with communication? And that's how I see the biggest influence of technology on business etiquette. Whatever change we're seeing in the world of etiquette has been rapidly around the scope of communication. Now, why is that so? Now, just think about the common the modern workplace. You have, uh, you know, how you have somebody from the uh, a generation which was born around 1945. So, some of my very senior mentors, a very senior uh, manager, or maybe the chairman of the organization, is somebody who's born in the era between 1945, uh, you know, so 1950, 1955, and then you have the Gen Zs who were born after 1995. Right? Both of them have come together. In the workplace. Now, the older generation has grown up, you know, preferring face to face meetings. I remember one of my managers in my career saying that uh, I don't trust emails. And this is way back in, you know, uh, early 2000 when he would say that if I want to have an honest conversation, if I want to gauge the person across, I need to meet the person. I wonder what he talk, what he thinks of today, in today's day and age, when probably meeting a person face to face is next to impossible considering we are all under lockdown and we have social distancing norms and so on and so forth. But that's what the generation preferred. You have baby boomers who, you know, so our parents who preferred landline, right? I, I still remember my mother being extremely uncomfortable with the mobile phone bill because she used to, she used to believe that, you know, it's just too expensive. They much preferred the landline, you know, landline phone, they preferred those. Now, Generation X, which is probably, you know, my generation would, prefer emails because you know we discovered emails we like the concept and the, the clarity of thought that came with writing down our thoughts and sending them across we also prefer documentation then you have the millennials who prefer texting now you have gen z's most of you are from that generation who prefer instant messaging whatever thoughts i have i message and i send it across now when all of these come together what you have to understand is that the the impact of this all of this comes straight away into the way we communicate, right? Now, here's what I want you to remember when you think of the influence of technology on changing business etiquette. The rule of thumb is still the same. So no matter what generation you are, the rule of thumb is always the same, that no matter what mode of communication you prefer using, remember that the onus or the accountability of your communication lies with you the sender of the message. And if it's something that you would not do in person, example, if it's if it's what you're writing on, on an IM chat or a WhatsApp chat is something you would not say to a person in person, don't do it over any other modes of communication. I uh, couldn't get that point. Don't do it. Any over other? any other mode of communication. If you would not do it to me in person, okay, okay. so Devika, if it's something you will not say to me in person, if we met, mm -hmm. don't do it over mm -hmm. instant messaging. Don't send this message over WhatsApp. Don't send that message over Instagram or any other mm -hmm. media platform that you're using. Right? So no matter whatever technology, very has, yeah, whatever technology has impacted, that rule of thumb remains the same. True. True, ma'am. Impactful thought. Yeah. According to you, what are some etiquettes that everyone should incorporate, regardless of the industry they are working in? Okay. Hmm, now that's a very interesting question. Um, 
okay, I'm considering that on a, I'm, I'm taking into account that most of us are entering a workplace uh, and would be working, uh, you know, with others. Let's let's start with the first one. When you're working in a in a in a in an in, a, in an industry or in an organization, it's pretty much like a, an, I would say a society by itself, or it's like an ecosystem of its own. It's like probably like your house or your home or your family or your extended family is an ecosystem by itself. Your workplace is, is similar, and therefore it has a culture. The first thing that I would uh, say, or, or is the first rule of etiquette that you must incorporate, regardless of the industry that you're working in, is understanding your workplace culture and the standard codes of conduct. Because every organization has a standard code of conduct. And when you join the organization, no matter you know what industry the organization in, is in, you need to take the effort to understand what works here. So I'll give you a classic example. Uh, some years ago, you know, as a part of my role as a management consultant, we were working with um, we were working with an organization which was in the uh, the manufacturing se sector, and they had just opened up a new uh, way of doing business. As a, as a consequence of that, they had to hire a lot of new talent from engineering colleges. Now, when they when they got this talent in, now this engineering college talent was very uh, you know had done internships in IT companies. So something as simple as dressing up to work was a very casual way for them because when they were working, let's say, an IBM or a Microsoft, they could land up any time of the day because, you know, Microsoft had flexible working hours. Uh, you know, they could wear whatever they felt like working because Microsoft promoted it. But this organization, being a manufacturing setup, had a very strong code of conduct around dressing. They also had a very strong code of conduct around what, what time would people report to work? Now, when we were working with them, uh, we were working with them on a very different mandate, a, a managerial mandate, actually called us aside and said, can you do something to, in their terms, fix this? So we said, we don't have to fix it. We just have to talk to your people and let them know, or rather you have to talk to your people and let them know that this is how we expect you to be here. Maybe they just haven't realized that this is the code of conduct here. And that's probably what I'm saying to you from the other side. So when you are working in an organization, be extremely particular about understanding the workplace culture and the standard code of conduct. That's the first one. The second one, my dear friends, is about minding your manners. I just said that a little while ago, your, your behavior reflects your attitude. So when you go to the workplace, no matter what industry you work in, certain things that are non-negotiable. Respect. Respect for everyone and their perspectives, uh, their individualities is a manner. Being disciplined about timelines, about, about time in general, being punctual is a manner. It reflects your attitude. Those are things that, that need to really be on point. You know, minding your manners has to be something that has to be completely on point. The third thing would be about communicating, balancing two things, balancing confidence and carefulness so who are you speaking with it's great to be confident it's great to put across your thoughts in a very clear manner you know being articulate is fantastic but what is also important is being conscious of your stakeholders who are you speaking with if you're speaking with uh you know and i would not say that you should be you know there should be a differential treatment i'm not saying be very nice to your managers and be not so nice to your juniors in fact be highly respectful to both but when you're writing out, let's say you're writing a mail or when you're speaking to clients or customers, you should at all given points of time have clarity about what you're trying to communicate to whom for what effect. I'll repeat that. What you're trying to communicate to whom for what effect. Keep that in mind. And the final one is find a balance between the personal version and the professional version of yourself. You know, as, as um, social creatures, we tend to share a lot of information about our personal lives, with our co-workers. We all like meeting people. Most of us like to. It's very important to maintain and respect personal boundaries for not just yourself, but for others as well. The so five quick tips that I would lay say, or five tips, uh, tips about professional etiquette that matter, no matter what industry you're in. I'll quickly repeat. 
first one, understanding the work culture and the standard codes of conduct. Second one is about minding your manners, uh, you know, being respectful of everyone and also making sure that you're respectful of timelines. Third being, being respectful of others and their perspective, uh, but also communicating confidently and carefully. And the final one would be about finding the right balance between your professional version and your personal version. Stay true to who you are, but make sure that you, you respect your own boundaries and the boundaries of others. Definitely, ma'am. Definitely, it has reached out to us very well and it's considered as very valuable to all of us, to all the young minds, ma'am. Thank you. So much. Do you want to take yes, a few questions in the chat? I do see some questions. Yeah. Okay. okay. There are some questions. Vani Gangil. Yes, hmm. ma'am. Vani Gangil has asked how business etiquettes affect the business in this severe pandemic? How business affect, affect the business in the severe pandemic? Uh, yeah. Okay. I, Vani, I'm, I'm assuming and hoping this question uh, means that how has the lack of business etiquettes affected the business in the severe pandemic? I don't know what the question is hinting towards. How business etiquettes affect the business in, in this severe pandemic, maybe, yeah, as you uh, uh, assumed it to be. I, I'm hoping Mani has, yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes. Uh, so, okay. Mani, when people started working, so about a year ago, uh, you know, around March 2020, when all of us started working from home, uh, why most of us thought that, you know, it's something, first of all, it was not something that we were ready for. And we all saw that as an interim measure. So we, most of us thought that, you know, this is just a stopgap measure. And soon we'll be back meeting, you know, our friends, meet, meeting our colleagues, our co-workers quickly again. What we also weren't prepared for was how will we continue to work seamlessly the way we did when we worked in person? So things like, you know, we took things like collaboration, things like common problem solving. We took things like, uh, you know, collaborative decision making for granted. And when we, when we started working, uh, you know, virtually, these are concerns that started coming up. I remember as, and I faced this as, as a team lead, I faced this as a function head, where even arriving at a, a simple solution, you know, in a group of people who were struggling with maybe the medium, some of us were struggling with using Zoom, some of us were struggling with, you know, I can speak to people when I meet them in person, but I cannot articulate over a virtual platform. I don't enjoy this. So from struggling with the personality, to struggling with the medium, to struggling with tools, right? There was a huge, huge gap that most workplaces felt, which is why very quickly learning and development teams across organizations kicked into action and started, you know, formulating these modules. You must have seen that there were mod modules like working effectively in virtual teams, leading effective teams, because we actually saw a gap there. So we had to kick in and help managers lead teams virtually. We had to very quickly prepare modules where people could, uh, you know, could present themselves and could show up meaningfully in virtual meetings. So the impact, just to answer your question, was was highly, uh, what do I say? It was felt by one and all. But thankfully, I think as we are, I think human beings are highly resilient and we are very quick learners. We've also learned how to maximize the virtual environment for what it is. So personally, I'm still waiting to go back to work very quickly. Okay. So it says that you haven't uh, yet stepped out or you still work from home. Oh, we are, we are still working from home. We have my, so my organization, okay. we are completely working from home. I. That's a great lead. I'm hoping um, we go back sometime this year. It doesn't seem very likely. Yeah. That's a great lead as well. Okay. Yeah. I hope your question is answered, Vani. Vani, you can give us a yes. If you have a subsequent question, please ask oh, that. She has asked one more. Yeah. What are some rules? What are some rules in virtual working environment of business etiquettes? Yeah. Okay, so this is, I think this is a good one. Um, and I was going to cover this either ways when we were speaking about, um, you know, specific behaviors. Yeah. Uh, I think the first one, again, I'm going to go back to communication. Uh, and I'm going to probably sound like a broken drum, but it's very important that all of us pay attention. Uh, I think the first one is going to be uh, about being mindful about your virtual communication. And communication could be all three. It could be verbal, nonverbal, and written. 
Now, what, what do I mean when I say being mindful? Each mode of communication comes with certain strengths and certain loopholes. For example, uh, like I said, uh, us, you know, us uh, Gen Ys, we really enjoyed emails because we we thought it was a great way to document. You know, you very quickly are your you're, you're thinking straight when you're writing and then you can shoot it down. But what we happily forgot is that writing as a mode of communication is, is very, very open to misinterpretation. If there is a concern that you're trying to deal with, there's a problem that you're trying to solve, probably the email is not the best way of, of addressing it. So when I say being mindful about your communication in the virtual world, being very careful about what particular mode of communication to use, use the appropriate mode. Now, when would you use an email? When you need to provide a lot of details, where, will like I said, documentation will help both you and the recipient. So, you know, you have like a lot of material to send. You write it down. There's a process that you have to explain. You send across a slide deck. The person can review it. And then both of you can keep the document. Now, when would you use the phone call or when would you prefer a video call? When something is time sensitive. I have lost track of the time when I tell my own team I lead a small team of about six people and I keep telling them that, you know, if something is time sensitive, writing a mail is probably the worst thing you can do to the other person. Because you're taking it for granted, specifically in today's time when we're all working from home, at home, through home, everything. It's probably taking a little too much for granted because probably the person is not in front of the system. So if something is time sensitive, don't write an email. Also, like I said, if something... If you believe that there is a high probability for misinterpretation, you want to apologize, you want to check, uh, you know, you want to curb an escalation, you want to solve a problem, pick up the phone and talk or ask people to come on to a video call. Don't do it over email. You're never going to find a resolution. When do you use IM, your instant messaging tool? When you have a short, straightforward message. Again, I've lost track of people. Uh, you know, sometimes you open your IM chat in the morning and you have somebody who's written 25 messages to you. And I'm like, why am I reading 25 messages here? Because probably when he was or she was sleeping in the night, they thought this is something they want to discuss with me and they kept typing. 25 messages on WhatsApp make no sense unless you're writing to a friend who'd like to listen to you. But in a professional environment, then either you email or you pick up the phone and call. It doesn't make sense on IMs. So the first one, my friends, is being mindful of your communication in the virtual world. Second one is about understanding the virtual meeting tools and the etiquette associated with it. We're currently using a virtual meeting tool. We're using Zoom. You must be using Microsoft Teams or Google Meet or whichever one you're using. Uh, I think it's very critical that you, if you're new to the system, if you're new to the tool, understand how it works. Maybe take a quick class online, uh, you know, figure out uh, what are the, uh, you know, what are the usage within the tools? So each tool comes with some, some possibilities uh, that you can, you know, utilize uh, in the tool. So make sure that you understand the tool, make sure that you practice. Uh, and a couple of things that I might want to just tell everyone, I think here Devika has muted everybody. But the first one, I think background noise is the number one killer for meetings. I'm sure you've all come across a lot of um, videos, meme chats, cartoons during the round, uh, you know, where people have, left their videos uh, you know open when they shouldn't have left it open or they've forgotten to unmute their, sorry mute their lines when they should have muted them and it's created a lot of embarrassment and chaos so muting yourself when you're not speaking is very critical when you're on a zoom meeting platform or any virtual meeting platform like this i think i want to spend a little bit time also talking about um i don't want to go into the whole aspect of grooming and dressing up I understand these are crazy times we live in and most of us have a lot of um, you know, troubles and trials to deal with on a regular basis. But I will still recommend that if you are on in a Zoom meeting or any kind of a virtual meeting and you expect it to be on video, it's always worthwhile to dress professionally, also being mindful of who is going to be in the meeting. If specifically, if you're meeting with a client, make sure that you show up as an ambassador of your organization. So you do not come dressed as something that is not appropriate. Uh, nobody's expecting you to wear a suit. You know, in initial days of the work from home, all of us used to deck up for work. We used to wear professional wear. And then there were some days we couldn't bother to get out of our pajamas. So we've, we've all gone through both sides. We've all gone through places where we've worn just T-shirts or, you know, a workwear on top and pajamas below. 
everything is fine. What's visible should be appropriate, should be professional. So make sure that you show up and you dress up when you show up, right? Um, punctuality again. I couldn't speak, um, I, I, I couldn't iterate as, as much as I should that I, I think one of the number one concerns that people are seeing uh, these days, and I think we're also facing a lot of virtual meeting fatigue, is that people don't join things on time. People don't land on time. They're not being punctual. And that is often being cited as a concern by everyone. So my recommendation to you is that if you block time with someone, it's also about respect. Remember, it's about the manners. So make sure that you land up on time. And when you're there, uh, don't multitask. Because people can make up. You'd be surprised that they can make out. From your voice, from your face, they can make out that you're not paying attention. Don't multitask while you're in the meeting. Again, the rule of thumb, think of the virtual meeting as a substitute for the in-person meeting. What you would not do in an in-person meeting, don't do it in a virtual meeting. Do not do it. It'll be rude. Very, very clear tips, ma'am. I hope your question is answered. Ma Thank you for this question as well. Yeah, I'm sure ma'am, all of us as even faced in the class, class that we attend, they make out, we get caught very easily. I am so sure. Very, very relatable, ma'am, very relatable. In fact, if I may just add a couple of more things which go beyond etiquette, uh, and I think it will be really helpful for those of you who are beginning work right now, and you know, your uh, I must share a little snippet with you. So I I joined my current role. I currently lead um, talent development for Sun Life Financial. I joined my current role uh, in the pandemic. I haven't had the opportunity to meet any of my team members. My offices are in Gurgaon and I'm currently stationed away from Gurgaon and I haven't had an opportunity to go to work because the office has been closed. We've been working from home. I lead a team. I have a huge number of stakeholders and I haven't met anyone. And trust me, I have been practicing everything that I'm telling you today to the utmost. Because in the absence of that, there's no way you will find yourself comfortable. So a couple of more things that I wanted to share with all of you, specifically if you're starting to work uh, you know, in a virtual environment, if this is your first job or you're shifting a job and you're moving to the virtual environment, I mean, you're doing it in a virtual manner, a uh, couple of things that I would also want to share with you is that, you know, make sure that you uh, build a work environment. It's very important. I understand space could be a constraint, but make sure that even if it's a small part of the house, you know, you are, you make sure that you create an environment which is not fussy, uh, you know, which can just help you work and focus on what you're doing. Because not only does it keep you focused, it keeps others who are with you on the virtual environment also focused. Because the less distracted you are, you transmit that distraction onto screen. Very critical that you, you know, keep that environment like, like a sanctuary, like a work sanctuary, with work desk or whatever you want to call it. Make sure that is that is in place. Uh, for those of you who are going to be working in multicultural environments, one little tip that I would like to share with you is being very sensitive to cultural differences, specifically time zones. A lot of times we're hearing people like, I have team members sitting out of Canada and I have team members sitting out of Philippines. And we have meetings that are early in the morning and we have meetings which are late in the evening. And honestly, uh, if we are not mindful of the fact that some of our team members have logged in really early in the morning to accommodate us, whereas some of the Philippine uh, team members have logged in, uh, logged in really late in the night just to, just to be accommodative of us, I think we'll be doing them a great disservice. So being mindful and being sensitive of that also helps you come across as genuine, as authentic. The final one, uh, the card, everybody else that I'd, I'd like to talk to you about, specifically in the virtual space that we're working, is to make sure that you continue to build trust. And the only way you can build trust in the virtual environment is to start by being trustworthy yourself. I have a very favorite, I would have, to have a favorite quote from Stephen uh, R. Covey, who says that trust is about character, consistent character and competence. If you're starting work virtually, make sure that you consistently demonstrate your character and deliver on your outcomes to show up on your competence because it's critical people who haven't met you there's a very different bonding when people have and they meet you in person when you start uh, working virtually it's important that you show up with both your character and your competence consistently because that helps you in in building trust with your colleagues just that little addition Devika. 
Yes, ma'am. We are indeed today literally so indeed to listen to you and your inspiring talks, ma'am. Thank you so much. Yes. Oh, uh, yeah. We'll take up the follow-up questions later, ma'am. Sure, sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, moving on. Emails are the most important form of communication in the work environment, as you had mentioned earlier. Right. So what are some points that people should keep in mind while writing work emails? Okay. Uh, Devika, again, I'm going to go back to what I said earlier. When you're writing a, a piece or document, I mean, apart from the fact that I'll say there are two aspects to a good email. One is the functional aspect, which is basically, do you understand the tool that you're using? Now, most of us could be using Gmail or whatever, uh, you know, Outlook. Most of us would be, if you're at work, you're using Outlook. I don't know what the Apple users use, but Microsoft users use Outlook. Now, you, you have to understand the functionality of that tool that you're using. So that's one aspect. Now, the second aspect, and why do I say that? Because I have come across so many people who forget simple basic rules like not marking every single mail as important. It's like that bad wolf story, right? You can't keep crying wolf. If every mail is important, then the recipient doesn't know which one really is important. And it's a very distressing or disappointing to find an email marked important which truly wasn't important and and sometimes when you ask people why they're doing that well because they didn't understand the tool right another another rule of thumb is you never mark anybody on bcc right it is not something that we appreciate or encourage in a in a, in a, in a professional environment now sometimes people end up doing that because they do not understand the tool the bcc would probably be a mail that reaches out to someone without all the the recipients knowing who has been marked. That's the functionality of the tool. Now let's come to the behavior aspect of it. Even your English or the grammar is functionality. Because eventually, English is like any other language. It's like C++ or Python, right? It's like any other language. You know English or you do not know English does not really impact your business communication. Your business communication is your understanding of who are you writing to? What are you writing for? And what is the message that you want to convey? What do you want the other person? I mean, am I just writing to Devika because I wanted to say hi to her? Well, in that case, hi, Devika, I just wanted to check on you. That's also an action. If I want to write to Devika to let her know about something, I need to construct my mail in a manner that it gives Devika the exact information that she needs to know. A quick rule of thumb when you're writing emails, one is being extremely aware of your target audience. Who are you writing to? What are you trying to do with that mail? Why, why are you writing this mail? And third, what do you want them to do with that? Is it just an FII, like for your information? Do I want something from you? Right, so when you construct the mail, start by a salutation. A lot of people ask me, do I write dear Mr. So-and-so or do I write dear name? Honestly, go by your organization's work conduct. If your organization, you know, there's certain organizations that still uh, prefer that somebody senior or everybody in the organization refers to each other by Mr. and the surname. It is never Mr. and first name or Miss and first name. It always has to be Mr. or Ms. and the, and the surname. Some organizations prefer that. Some of the organizations are casual or informal enough to say you can refer to everybody as first names. However, you go about, again, observe other emails. When you join an organization, the first thing that you should do is check out the emails from other people. How are they writing? What's the kind of language that they're using? What salutations are they using? Right, so make sure that you confirm to the same. After those are done, in your first line, there has to be a context. Why are you writing? Why am I writing to Devika? Do I just want to say hi? Do I want something from her? Do I want to inform her? What do I want? Why is this? Why should I even read ahead? It informs the reader what's coming up. And then go ahead and explain whatever has to be written. One word of advice, if you have a lot of things to speak of, which are descriptive in nature, and they are, uh, they are something like a process flow, the best thing to do is probably just use bullets. So this is step one, two, three, four. But if it's something that's descriptive in nature, please don't bulleticize it. You'll kill it. Right, so go ahead and, you know, describe whatever. And people ask me, that really is, are bullets better than paragraphs? They just have a different use. Not all art students use bullets and not all science students use, use 
sorry, not all our students use paragraphs and science students use bullets. It should not be like that. It should just be about what do you want to write? Very well said. No? Very well said. Right. So yeah. all I get this, we're an engineer, I'm going to write bullets. And I'm like, try writing your life story with bullets. That's going to be very <laughs> funny to read. <laughs> yeah. Right. So subject matter defines whether you use bullets or you use your uh, you know, paragraphs. Either ways, make sure it's short, concise, and then go ahead and finish with a proper salutation. Yes. Ma'am, one thing from my end, mm -hmm. uh, how can we keep a subject line brief, very brief? Do yes. you? Yeah. Yes. So thank you so much. That That's a great question. I also wanted to highlight that the subject is another thing that's often missed by people. And I'm pretty suspicious of when I get mails in my inbox with no subject because I don't know what to make of it. Yeah. After that, I'm checking whether it's spam or when I, it's, it's a phishing mail. Uh, but then coming back to subject lines, what is it? What's the context? So what is it that you're writing about? So for example, if I'm writing a mail and I've written a lot of mails checking on people during the pandemic, maybe the subject line could just be checking on you. Okay. Right? Or writing in to say hi. If you're just writing to a, to a colleague, you know, after a long time. But if, for example, if I want a report from you, Devika, if I want like a, a dashboard of, let's say, the last, uh, you know, sales meeting that we had, then I would, I need to write requesting the dashboard, the sales dashboard. Or I may want to say, if I'm inviting you to a meeting, then I need to write meeting request for whatever. Please understand your subject lines also ensure that the person who's receiving the mail can prioritize when to see your mail. True. Because it's very unfair that you write a subject line which is like alarm bells are ringing and inside you're just saying hi. That would be very mean to do to someone. True. Get that now. I get that. Yeah. yeah? True. Thank you, mom. Thank you. Yeah. What are some behaviors that people should avoid at all costs? Oh, I think I, I'm going to sum that up. And I've said a lot about things what people should do. I think I'm just going to say two, two behaviors that people must avoid at all costs. It's, it's not just professional etiquette or personal etiquette, but just avoid them. One is being disrespectful in speech, tone, or actions. I think respect is, like I said, the, the bedrock of etiquette across the world three things it's it's basic kindness it's respect and it's consideration being dis disrespectful to anyone in speech tone or action is something that you need to avoid at all costs right and the second and the most important is not taking accountability of your own communication when you are communicating when you send out a message like no matter what platform that is it, i could be speaking right now that is one message my instant messaging is, is another form of messaging WhatsApp, chats, texts, emails, but not taking accountability of your own communication is a behavior that you need to avoid at all costs. So just two things. A lot of good things that you can do, but don't do these, these two things. One is being disrespectful and the other is not taking accountability. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, so uh, this, I guess this coming question is very relatable to you, as you mentioned before mm -hmm. since many people have started their first jobs in a work from home environment as you told that first team lead that you have taken so how can they develop good business etiquette how can they develop good business etiquette how can they develop good business etiquette i again i think it goes back to what i said Devika, earlier so if they're picking up a new job the first thing would be understand the organization's code of conduct understand what's the work culture it's a good thing to speak to your uh, somebody who's in, you know, who's inducting you saying, what are some of the things that we don't do here? What are some of the things that we do here? It's very important to ask that question when you are, when you're joining a new organization, getting an insight from somebody who's an insider, your manager, if maybe, or your HR business partner, somebody to guide you saying some things we do here, some things we don't do here. I think it's very critical being very respectful of the organization's culture is the other thing that I would say. And the third and the final, I think, thing, just recapping what we said earlier, uh, as, I think as, as a professional, it's very critical that you, you err on the side of caution. I would say be cautious five times is much better than being casual, too casual or informal one time and making a mistake. And if you do make a mistake, please be very, very open to apologizing. Very quickly going back and telling people that I'm sorry, you know, I messed up. I'm new to the place. I didn't realize. Or I, I was disrespectful. I didn't realize I was disrespectful. I'm sorry. 
Right. So I think we've, we've had this question going round and round. Uh, so just a couple of things that I would say is figure out the organizational culture, uh, listen to the code of conduct and follow the code of conduct. And about your personal etiquette, I think we've speak and spoken a lot about communication, about being respectful of other people, about being punctual and, and being on time, and also about drawing your personal and professional boundaries. Yes, ma'am. Become very, point. very conscious of the time. And I see some very interesting questions in the chat as well as in the yeah. questions. So uh, do you want to take the follow-up questions now? Yes, I think we should do that. Sure, sure, sure. I'm, I'm just... wondering which ones to go for. Ma. Okay, I can see the one from Path right here. What can be kept in subject if we are attaching multiple subject contents in mail? Uh, is Path, it okay? If, yeah. Yes. Path, if you're sending out a subject matter that, that requires different subject lines, for example, it cannot be summed up in one subject line, then yes, it makes sense to send out different mails, even if you're marketing to the same person. So sometimes you, for example, want to talk about, let's say, flowchart A and you want to talk about process B, it makes no sense to write flowchart A and process B in the subject line. Make sure you send out two different mails because I'm assuming and hoping that you will have different actions expected from the individual. Even if it's FII, if it's just for the information of the individual, make sure that the individual knows what to expect. It's like, think about it. If you were talking to me in person and you were talking about two things, would you start by, you could start by saying, I need to talk to you about this and this, but then you would, Tell me both the things separately. You wouldn't jumble up both of them, right? Think of it from that perspective. I hope that answers your question, Bhai. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Ma'am, there's one more question by Charul. Uh -huh. Are there any books or YouTube videos where we can develop our communication skills? Your communication skills? Oh, yes, there are. Uh, there are tons of tons of videos and I mean, I, I may not be able to give you names right off, but I would say, uh, you know, the purest or the, the old timers will talk about the likes of Dale Carnegie's, the Dale Carnegie's book about uh, influencing and winning friends is, is a great book. Uh, but what, what you will also really um, benefit from, I don't know if most of you have heard of a body of work or a body called Postmasters. I'm going to write it in the chat window so that you don't get it wrong. It's called Postmasters. Now, this particular organization, it's a, it's a not-for-profit body. It does some amazing work in the space of public speaking and communication. They actually hold uh, workshops. Uh, you know, they have, uh, they have a lot of sessions, the training sessions. They also have competitions where people uh, come out and uh, you know, hone their skills. They actually work on their public speaking skills. They have a wide variety of, of content that they push out from time to time. They, they have local chapters. So you may have a Toastmasters chapter right near in a college or a school or even an organization. And I, to my understanding, the membership is free. Please feel free to sort of go online, look up Toastmasters. You will find a lot of value, uh, you know, in the work that they do. It's a great body to, to hone your communication skills. It, it has answered uh, his question, I feel. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, yeah. yeah, Supramaniam. Yeah, he's saying, ma'am, can I understand communication is the most important aspect of business etiquette? Uh, Superman, that, that's a beautiful question because, uh, you know, no matter what we do as human beings, because we have the gift to, to communicate, whether we communicate verbally or non-verbally, Whatever we have, whether it in terms of our etiquette or our manners, we come through only in the communication. It's going to be always through your communication. I may have a very example. I may really respect someone, but how do I demonstrate that respect? Either through my behavior, which is non-verbal, or through my conversation, which is verbal. Right. So your mode of Conversing with the world, your mode of interacting with the world is through your communication. So that's that's why it's the underlying, uh, what do I say, fundament to etiquette. I'm happy. Thank you. you. Yes, he has got it, ma'am. Ma'am, there is one more interesting question, uh -huh. which all we face. Uh, yeah, even I had the question of the same. So how can we avoid nervousness, nervousness habits, and yeah. know about audience well? Ah, so that this is this is a great question. Now, uh, I want you to know that having those butterflies in your tum stomach, which sometimes feels like elephants in your stomach, they're jumping all over, is a good thing. 
I had mm-hmm. those. So I, I facilitated, I think somewhere close to 7,500 plus hours. But even today before a session, I am extremely nervous. Extremely nervous. I, I, there's some trip, trip, I would say tips and tricks that I try. I try having some cold water. I try putting in some activities. So I walk around the place. But I think I've come to an understanding that some stress, which I call you stress, EU, you stress is good stress. stress. Yeah. So there's you stress and there's distress. Okay. Now, how can you avoid distress by being prepared? You need to be prepared. You need to be thorough with your subject matter. That's the only way you can beat nervousness. But the other thing that you can do to take care of the you stress is let it, let it happen. Feel that little bit of tinge of you know anxiety because it, it keeps you on your toes. It keeps you from performing, being lackadaisical about your performance. It makes you uh, more focused on what you want to do. So the you stress is great. But then, okay, if it's getting into distress, some quick tips that I do usually is making sure I'm thorough with my... Uh, with my subject material. If I'm not thorough with it, I keep my cue cards ready. Uh, another thing that really comes handy is to make sure that I rehearse with someone. Probably not for the session, but for a lot of, uh, you know, sessions that, that make me uncomfortable that I'm not very thorough with, I will rehearse. I will act hold of someone who's willing to sit through the rehearsal and I will make sure that I rehearse my content. Simple things is prepare, prepare and prepare. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. So I guess we have completed in the chat box. Let's check into Q and A sections. Okay. Uh, uh, I can see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I understand okay. the importance of communication and corporate and professional world. Could you please share some tips for developing communication skills for an introvert? I am an introvert. Uh, Kumar, if it is any, um, this this conversation is not about uh, you know psychology, but I must also share a little insight. Uh, from a psychological uh, understanding of myself, I am an introvert too. The understanding that introverts and extroverts are, so extroverts are the guys who like to talk and introverts are the guys who like to keep quiet is a this, very typifying one. If I were to uh, explain, yes, go ahead, Devika. You yes, ma'am. Uh, we have one more diversion. Like I'm a psychology student. So okay. there's one more ex- extension of ambivert as well. Yes, there's an ambivert as well. Ambivert as well. Yeah. I would say human beings come in, you know, so be, I mean, c- coming from this, from a psychological understanding, I can also share with you that I also believe that to find human beings into introverts, extroverts, and ambiverts is actually doing disservice to the beautiful, uh, you know, schema that we are. We are multiple shades. And to answer your question, Kumar, I think uh, to say that introverts are not great communicators would probably be doing disrespect to them. Probably the the mode of communication that introverts would choose or the audience of communication may be much more smaller than an extrovert. So do I like being the center of of a larger stage? Possibly no. Is it something that I've had to learn over a period of time because my chosen field of work puts me into it? Yes. I've practiced the skills that make me more comfortable in in public. But given a choice, I'd still like to talk to only a few people. Probably my circle of friends or circle of people that I speak to or the number of people I speak to in a day will be very limited. So remember I said professional and personal boundaries, personas. So you, when you learn or when you, you have to understand, so either you make a choice to be in a career or in a... Uh, you know, in a role that does not really require a lot of interaction. But to be honest, my friend, those careers or those roles are very few because most of our roles today require considerable amount of interaction with your co-workers or colleagues. Here's what I would like to say that probably brush up on some skills that make you more comfortable. And also let go of the tag. Just let go of the tag. Introverts are great communicators. Remember, just the audience that they prefer is smaller. I hope I'm able to answer and make you feel a little better about that. Wow, ma'am. Very beautifully said. Very beautifully said, ma'am. Yeah. Mahima has asked, being a team lead, how should I make my team work effectively? And Mm -hmm. what to do when they're not working properly? Mahima, that's that's a question that's been uh, troubling a lot of team leads, specifically, like I said, during the virtual working uh, you know, when we were meeting people in person, uh, not only were we able to drive better outcomes, but we were also able to work with our team more cohesively. Like I said, human beings are not meant to be, uh, you know, working the way we are right now. We were 
I don't know how the future of work will be, and I'm hoping it's not purely uh, virtual. I hope it's hybrid to say the best. Uh, but having said so, some things that really work is, uh, like I said, understanding the platform of communication. For example, not like I said earlier, not everything about work necessitates a video call. Now I see a lot of team leads saying, oh, "We want to discuss this. Let's jump onto a call," and that's why people are experiencing Zoom fatigue. Understanding what your team outcomes are, setting those expectations with them, probably as a group together and then one on one, makes for amazing virtual teamwork. So letting your people know that this is what I expect out of you, this is when you can expect support from me. Setting those expectations very explicitly is an important aspect of virtual team working because in the absence of that, please understand when we were working in person, a lot of it was something that we shared because we were working together. Imagine your manager came to the floor and shared information with the whole team. The whole team heard it, and people just understood everything. Now that's not happening anymore. We're all virtual, so probably your manager is having conversation that you're not. You're having to cascade. So making sure you set right expectations about work outcomes, about the support that they can expect from you, and when to expect that support from you is very critical. That aspect. The second is how do you monitor work outcomes? So how are you going to, uh, you know? How are you going to really check on work outcomes? Are you going to check through emails? Are you going to check through reports? Again, goes back to the first one: expectations. So, when can I know that you've done what I needed you to do? Right, setting very clear uh, processes for working is something that is probably the one thing that a virtual team leader can do now. And the final thing that I would talk about is figuring up tools that help you collaborate better. For example, if you're brainstorming. Getting six people together on a video call may not help because not everybody is comfortable talking. Maybe something that will really help is using a whiteboarding tool. So you know, get everybody together on a whiteboard tool. There are multiple whiteboard tools available. Uh, most of them are free. You know, getting everybody together. Say, okay, so here we are going to ideate now. Or if you're doing problem solving, maybe sending the problem ahead of time and saying, think about it and let's come together with solutions. So some smart working ways which. Uh, minimize the kind of time that people have forced to spend together, but at the same time, uh, you know, also ensuring that they are able to collaborate in the best possible manner. The final thing that I would say, Maima, is understanding and empathizing with people. I think the one thing that's taking team leads the distance at this time is just being extremely kind, being very, very kind to your team members, understanding that each one of us going through things that are not normal. This is not how the world is supposed to be. And each one of us is struggling in a in a in a different battle of our own. So we, like I keep saying, we're all in the same storm, but we're not in the same boat. Some of us have yachts. Some of us have maybe dinghies. Some of us have light boats. We're all in different boats right now. So just being extremely kind and empathizing with your people will probably will just ride over this this time that we have. I hope I'm able to add value to what you're saying. Definitely, ma'am. Definitely. Uh, okay. Mahima, we are waiting for you to answer. Yeah, ma'am. Moving on. Yeah. Uh, ma'am, can you please guide us on what all should we keep in mind while preparing resume for freshers, freshers job or internship? Oh, that that, my dear friend, I I'd love to take on the question, but my worry is that we will probably spend another twenty minutes just talking about it. There are certain things that you may, uh, there are a lot of things that you may want to kind of pay attention to. Uh. I, I I'm sorry. I I don't know whether we can take that up, Devika. Right now, I don't want to sure. leave the conversation mid midway. Maybe we can have another session. I I don't mind coming on and talking about resumes another time. More than oh, happy. Wonderful, ma'am. I'm wonderful. so sorry. I, I'm not taking your question, my friend. Whoever put that question. Yeah, yeah it was anonymous. Anonymous. Yeah. I'm sorry, my friend, but we'll take up another session for it, and I'll I'll love it if you can come and attend. But we'll we'll have to have a more, uh, you know, a longish session for that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you have told my understand. Question from Parth. Okay. We sometimes know everything but got stuck while discussion because the yeah, person on the other side is more experienced and knowledgeable. Even if you make mistakes, that affects our outputs. What can be done for it? Parth, we all begin young. We all begin inexperienced. I, I would believe that the person on the other side is not taking any offense for your, uh, you know, for your youth or for your inexperience. I would just say being be comfortable about it. 
right? Just be comfortable about the fact if you, when you're young, you're inexperienced, you're learning. So I believe that the brilliant or the most beautiful power that a youngster has is saying, I don't know, sir, but I can find out. Or I don't know yet, but I'm learning. That's the biggest power that you have. That's the biggest boon that you have. You can say it when you're, when you're a youngster, when you're a fresher. Probably at my age, I don't get away with saying that very often. But I, I still, I must tell you, I say that. When I, when I work into a new domain, I am absolutely unabashed, not at all shameful about saying, I don't know, but I'll find out. Or I don't know, but I'm learning. It's absolutely okay. If it's affecting your output, tell the other person, you know, I do not know about this. I think I've messed up. But I can find out. And then find out. Take the effort. It's a learning curve. You will get there. Mama, I guess he has answered his question one more. Ah, but yes, but that's okay. Yes, that's a little bit of nervousness. Nervousness. Don't worry. Prepare part. Rehearse a little bit. Rehearse with someone. So maybe a good thing that we can do if you're preparing for an important interview or an important conversation is being prepared with the kind of questions that the person can ask you. Questions that this person can ask. And then prepare for those questions. What kind of answers should you put? And just write down some notes so that you can you have them handy when you're answering. I hope that will help us. Thank you, Ma. Thank you. I'm just checking on, did we cover every questions? Ma'am, uh, we missed one question. Uh, yeah, one uh, has asked. Minal, that's, I see a question from Minal. Minal, that's a wonderful question again. I don't know. Yeah. I don't think we can do justice to this question. Minal, if you can put this across to uh, the QFAS team, I'll be happy to take this question uh, through a mail or I don't know, I'll have to thought, see what we can do about this. But yeah. this question needs more more time. We are running short of time. Yeah. Ma'am, uh, we would like to take one last question. Sure, please. It was asked previously. Uh, how to neg negotiate salaries with boss and business? <laughs> <laughs> okay. If I knew the answer, my friend, I would probably... Uh, no, okay, that's, just, that's just kidding. I'm just joking around with you. Um, <laughs> Okay, I'm just trying to say how can I answer this question briefly and impactfully for you. I don't know if this question is coming from a fresher, if this question is coming from somebody who's just joining the workforce, something that will really help be helpful is to look at platforms like Glassdoor or maybe check on forums, uh, you know, which, which give you some kind of an idea of what kind of a salary benchmark are you looking at. I think, uh, but that again, the data will just give you an, uh, an insight into what you could look at. Uh, another thing that really helps freshers, again, I'm just assuming this question is coming from a fresher. If it's coming from somebody who's experienced, again, this is a fresher, ma'am. He's a fresher. fresher? Okay. Mm. If it's coming from a fresher, I think it's important to, uh, to check with people who are your seniors. And therefore, I keep saying this to uh, people who are entering the workforce again and again. Whatever college you come from, whatever uh, you know, university you have passed out, one thing that you must leverage is the power of the network or the alumni, alumni network. Because those are people who have probably similar qualifications, maybe slightly senior to you, have already entered the workforce and would be a good uh, you know, source of information in terms of what are the current benchmarks that are doing the rounds. If you are able to reach out to them and if you're able to nurture those, uh, you know, those relationships, you would really be able to uh, you gain a lot of information about the industry that you're going to enter into from them. It's a huge, huge, so, you know, those of you who are currently in college, make sure if you haven't already, you know, started establishing an al alumni network outreach, do that right away. Check who your seniors are, where are they working, reach them, reach out to them on LinkedIn. Trust me, nobody denies a request. I do get, I mean, I've passed out from college, you know, some ages ago, but I still get requests saying, you working in this industry, you know, I'm from your college. What is the current this thing? What can I expect to be paid? And I do a little bit of, you know, check from here or there, check with the HR teams and say, this is, this is probably the range that you must be looking at in this industry. So the best people to reach out to is your alumni. Or, and for those of you who are already experienced, uh, do check with, you know, friends within the industry. But the one thing that you must not do is write to a stranger on LinkedIn and ask them that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't, I mean, I know I'm, I may sound like I'm foolish, but trust me, I have requests coming from absolute strangers whom I never have heard of 
on LinkedIn saying, what is the average salary being paid to data analysts in your organization? Now, that's not a kind of query that anybody is going to address. But definitely, if you have someone in your network, a great way to go out and reach out is that. Uh, that's the best I can say about negotiating. But apart from that, negotiation techniques during uh, compensation conversations is yet another topic. We we'll probably need a, a much more uh, elaborate time than this for that. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. And unfortunately, it's the time to wrap up the session. But many students are willing, willing to uh, talk with you to share and ask questions. Definitely, sure. we can make another session sure. for that, no, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, so, sorry. We thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. And many of them has asked how to connect. Sure. So okay. I am. Uh, I believe Siddharth just posted something. You can write to Nidhi at QFAS. Guys, I am on LinkedIn. I'm assuming and hoping I would know you now. So, uh, you could just drop in a message. Maybe we can just chat on LinkedIn chat. And if it requires a conversation, I'd be more, more than happy to have a conversation as well. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, it's time to uh, wrap up the session. I'll be wrapping with an ending note. Out of all, ma'am, out of all, wholeheartedly would like to tell you thank you. You were a helping hand to all the inspiring minds today. The eagerness to answer the questions followed by students was very much engaging, ma'am. And forget not to mention the questions, the each tips and that you gave was very clearly understandable and was very helpful to all of us. In the beginning, uh, you had said one thought whether I could justify to the introduction what you gave, but I would definitely say it was extremely well said and more than what was expected from you. Ma really? That's why students are reaching out to you and definitely want another session with you. So today would like to conclude. We learned a lot from you. Thank you so Thank much. You so much. Thank you, David. Thank you, Thanks, Thank you, everybody. All the best. And like I said, feel free to reach out. More than happy to help in any way I can. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thanks. Take care, everyone. Stay safe and good night. Thank you, ma'am.